You are getting ready to listen to the voice of Dr. Radi Ferguson. 2004 Olympian. Four-time national judo champion. Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Author, speaker and coach. Hello, 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 hello. This is Dr. Roddy Ferguson, 2004 Olympian, four-time national judo champion, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt author, speaker, and coach. I'd like to come to you with another edition of Coffee with Roddy. Now, this particular episode, which is different than other episodes, because this episode is brought to you by my new book, Judo is Life. You can find it at www judoislife.net and in this book I kind of get naked in a sense and open up the the curtain and the back door of my life so that you can kind of see some of the things that I've been going through for the last two and a half years and how I utilize judo and my time on and off the mat to uh, work my some of my situations out and my problems in a therapeutic fashion while also utilizing traditional therapeutic modalities. Um, but I learned a lot from the sport of judo. And if you're in judo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, well, let me say that I learned a lot on the mat because I wrestled in college too and I've done jiu-jitsu. But the things that I've learned on the mat, I've been able to apply to my life. And if you're having any problems in your life, and I'm sure you are because we all have issues and problems. And hopefully you can utilize the book, Judo is Life, and understand the four parts of the judo throw, uh, which is the first part, kumikata, which is gripping and grab a hold of your situation. And then understand kazushi and how the off balancing that has happened in your life, you can redirect it and you can off balance the situation so you can get some leverage. And then security, how you can enter into new situations and new opportunities to fix your problems. And then kake, how you can execute, how you can throw, and how you can actually finish and then move to a different plane in life and a, a different position uh, and how to reposition yourself. So that's it. And let's just get into the talk for today. Um, a couple years back, man, I learned a great lesson from four-time Olympian Jimmy Pedro. Jimmy Pedro was also a two-time Olympic bronze medalist as well as a... Uh, 1999 world champion in the sport of judo and I was asking Jimmy how he did it and I don't even think Jimmy remembers this conversation as much as I do because it was so profound on my on my life and my career um, Jimmy was so kind to him and his wife to open up their home to me and a couple other judo players so that I can, you know, basically get an opportunity to see how he was able to reside in the United States and be such a high-level judo player. Um, I, I don't really think that people understand how good Jimmy Pedro was as a judo player, especially some of the people in the United, uh, in the United States, because when Jimmy was competing... There were not world championships every year. The world championships were held every other year. And I believe that Jimmy's best career of his life, well, the one that I saw, was in 1998. In 1998, I think, I don't remember the numbers exactly. I think Jimmy went something like 84 and 3. I know he did not, I know he didn't lose more than five matches that year, all right? It was ridiculous. He won everything. He won a tournament called the Shiriki Cup. It's one of the toughest tournaments. I think he's the only American to ever win the Shiriki Cup. Um, but there were no world championships that year. And I think he was in superb shape like that in 1997 for the world championships, but he got hurt. I believe he sprained his knee, uh, if I remember correctly, probably MCL sprain, and couldn't go to the 97 uh, World Championships. But you're looking at a person who we saw somebody like 
Kose Inoue win the 1999 World Championships, win the 2000 Olympics, and then come back and win the 2001 World Championships. It is quite possible, in my opinion, that if they had World Championships every year, you would have saw Jimmy Pedro be a 1997 World Champion, a 1998 World Champion, and a 1999 World Champion. And he was a 1999 World Champion. The three years that he was the, the, the three years that were the sweet spot of his career for the world championships, one of me he got hurt. Um, there are no European championships available because he's not from Europe. In 1998, he won everything and there were no world championships. And in 1999, when he was well, he won the world championships. So this is an individual that I'm talking about. And this is a person who um, opened up their, their home and their their life and their training so that I could see what he was doing and I mimicked it as, as closely as I could um, utilizing basically the the business model of best practices so you know you get close as possible to that particular model and look at the you look at the best practices of an individual and then you mimic them and at that, at that time in the United States Jimmy Pedro was the top person and uh that's who i tried to move myself after for those of all for those of you all who have followed me at all after i retired from judo from sport i thought i was i would do mma and when i wanted to do mma i literally got on a plane found rashad evans and trained in the same place that he was training in for about four or five days to do the same thing, to find out exactly where I was on the, and meaning can you do it, and then will you do it once you know what it is that you need to do. And going through the process of, of outlining what those best practices are, what those best practices look like, and putting it into motion is difficult. But I'm giving you that background because before I really jump into the story, I want to let you know that if you want to be an exemplar, if you want to be exemplary, sometimes you have to blaze the trail by yourself. However, there has been a trail blazed in different areas. And you can look at the people who have blazed those trails and look at the best practices and jump behind those best practices. They're, listen, success leaves clues. You can pick up on the clues of success and put your own success puzzle together. Because right now, the, the pieces are probably jumbled up in your life just like they're jumbled up in everybody else's life. And every time I start a new endeavor, they're jumbled up in my life too. And I gotta take the, I gotta take the pieces apart and then I gotta put my what, what, what I think what I think success looks like for the endeavor that I'm I gotta put those pieces of the puzzle together so I gotta take a sip of my coffee right now good morning sir so I'm out doing my walk while I'm talking to you so I'm I'm having this conversation with Jimmy going back and basically I'm having a conversation of Man, what, what do I have to do to improve? And I'm thinking that Jimmy's going to give me some long discussion about, you know, improving my waza and making sure that my and waza, and that's for people who don't do judo, your techniques, improve, improving my waza and, and training hard and, and working out until you throw up and, you know, doing this move and learn two throws forward and two back. He said, you have to get to the point when they look at the bracket that you, they're worried about you and you're no longer worried about them. He said, so for those who don't understand what the bracket is, if you do wrestling or judo or jiu-jitsu before the tournament they have something called the draw and they draw all the names out and then they put them in a bracket 
and then you see who's fighting who. You usually know how many fights you have to the finals. Usually it's three, anywhere from between three to five fights, and then you're in the finals. And when you're looking at your side of the bracket, you're counting one, two, three, four, five. And then you're looking at the names. You're looking to see who you got. And usually when you see who you got, either you're very excited or you're very concerned. <laughs> and when you when you have concern over someone else, like great concern, there's no way for you to win when you have a great concern. Because the reason why you have great concern is because you doubt your ability to win. And I'm sure there were times when Jimmy Page was competing and somebody looked at the bracket and saw that they had him and they were like, damn. And what he was telling me was I had to get to the point where people will look at my name on the bracket and then they will they, then they would say to themselves, damn, I got Ferguson. And I didn't realize how pregnant that statement was and how much work it took to get to that point. I do not believe that I ever got there on the high level, international level where people saw my name and they were like, damn. I do believe after the Olympics that people knew exactly who I was because I remember talking to the, I remember talking to the Mongolian team at the, I want to say it was the Junior World Championships after the, um, after the tournament at the uh, post-tournament party and they, the coaches walked up to me and of course, you know, broken English, broken language, um, because you know, I didn't speak Mongolian and they didn't speak very good English, but they knew exactly who I was. And they walked up to me and they were basically saying, you know, Murtegare, you, you, um, Nathan, Nathan. And they were letting me know that their 100 kilogram champion, Nathan, who utilized a lot of Murtegare, to win the Olympics in 2008, they were letting me know that, and we, we had to communicate back and forth through somebody else, that they had really watched and studied a lot of my film and videos of how I use Moro Tegari internationally in order to win, you know, win tournaments. Um, I'm nowhere close to a Travis Stevens or Kayla Harrison or Jimmy Pedro or anybody like that uh, on that particular level in terms of judo um, but it was nice to hear that I had made such an impact that there was something in, in the success of my career that left clues for someone else to utilize as a one of the small blocks in the building of their foundation of their career or their legacy I would say not his career but his legacy um, What I want to say to you is that there's so much that was encapsulated in that statement of creating a situation where they're worried about you and you're no longer worried about them. The, the first piece is having a mind shift and creating a situation where you are so locked in to what you're doing that you don't have time to think about what somebody else is doing you you have to you have to so, you know fall so in love with yourself and with the process that you have to know that what you're doing is the right thing for you to be successful now here's what happens a lot of athletes coaches and parents when they are sometimes on teams with coaches they're constantly either sitting in the stands or sitting on the sidelines questioning 
the coaching that's happening, questioning the team that their kid is on, questioning the things that they, and those things have nothing to do. They have nothing to do with you. They have nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter if you're on the greatest team or not. You still have the ability to get up at five o'clock in the morning, do your running. You still have the ability to get up at five o'clock in the morning, do 300 push-ups, squats, and sit-ups inside of your house. You still have the ability to get up in the morning and get a workout in. You still have the ability to get on the internet, find, find and book a, a, a free coaching call with damn near any coach in the country. You can get some of the best coaches in the country on a free coaching call. And then, then you can find out whether you want to invest with them or not, or at least sit down and get the information that you need, and then move forward. Man, you can become a uh, a YouTube genius. You can sit down and go through some stuff on YouTube. Now, some stuff is going to be good, some stuff is going to be bad. You're not going to know, but you can also get on Udemy.com and find out some stuff. Like, th- there's a lot of things that you can do to create your team. So that you can move yourself forward. That's what I had to do. Every coach that I had wasn't perfect, but every coach that I had was perfect for what they could provide. You know, my son is on a my son is on a track team now at a high school. He's on a track team now. I don't even know the head. I don't even know the, the name of the head coach. But if you ask me what type of track coach he was, I'll tell you this. He's the one that's available because I can talk as much trash as I want to about that coach. Bottom line is I'm not going to get up and leave my house and go sit at that high school and teach and teach no classes over there, nor am I going to sit down and deal with those hard-headed kids for an hour and a half, two hours every day. I'm not going to. So he is the best coach available right now. And what we have to do is we have to supplement what he's doing with some training in the morning. And not even supplement. Let me, let me be respectful. We're going to compliment what he's doing. With, with training in the morning. And he has some great people on his staff, some assistants. One that ran track D1, the other one that ran track D2. And I went out there and I talked to some of those people. And I asked if my son can be in the, the group with the person who ran Division One track. Because we got to do our best to get him what he needs. And we, we can't focus on what's not available. We got to focus on what's available and what we can do. And the second thing that I got from that situation was you have to get so involved in the work. Oh my gosh. When he said that, I didn't realize how much work was involved. I I worked out with Jimmy Pedro not not just on the mat, but I worked out with him with his strength and conditioning coach. I didn't. I had no clue. I mean, I played college football, man. I was a. I, I was a Division One athlete in college. I ran track. I wrestled. And I played football. I don't have any problem saying that from the inception of USA Judo till today, that there's not a better athlete that has come through USA Judo. It's just not. I mean, that's not. That's not. It's not me bragging or doing anything like that. It's way better judo players, but to be a Division One athlete and to play three sports and start in all three, very, very difficult to do. All right, doesn't doesn't happen often. It's a, it's a rare thing, and I can tell you that my athleticism and my mind are the things that allow me to scale up the ladder internationally in judo very quickly. Um, one thing I was not ready for is the the jump the jump and being a collegiate athlete to being a professional athlete and man i i worked out with guys in the nfl and i was i had and i have never and i mean i have never in my life Seen uh, anybody work out like Jim? I'm a listen. I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I got my strength and conditioning coach certification in 2001 through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. I've been an assistant strength coach at Towson State. Uh, I did my volunteer work at University of Maryland. 
I worked privately with one of the best strength coaches in the in the world, not only the country, the world, Juan Carlos Santana. Man, I've been all around. I've seen work. I've seen workers. I've been in the Olympic Training Center. I've seen Olympic. I think Olympic world class athletes work out. Two people, with three. Um, there's a guy by the name of Mark Freda, who's a triathlete, who was ranked number one in the world at the time, who I sat down and watched. I watched him do 26.2 miles in the gym at the OTC, and then and then after running the marathon, do his workout. I watched um, Apollo Anton Ono, all right? I watched him work out at the OTC. I sat down and watched, and I used to sit down and watch these people work out. I used to sit down and go watch these people work out because you, the one thing that you can't do is you, you can't go behind the scenes and watch world-class athletes work out. You can see clips of them on, online, but you've never seen their whole workout. I mean, I used to sit down and watch these people work out to glean what I could from the process, to see their attitude, to see the, to see how they train. I used to sit down and watch them work out. I also used to go in the, the weight room and watch the Olympic weightlifters work. I want to see. I want to see. I don't want to just see that you win the gold medal. I want to see what world class looks like. Man, Apollo Antonono, Mark Freda, and Jimmy Pedro, in my life, I have not seen anybody work out harder than those three people. Man, I have lifted with NFL linemen and put them underneath the gym when I was when I was training. Training with Jimmy tra- changed my perspective so much on understanding that you, you gotta create that near death experience inside of the gym so that you don't have it on the map. And my my workouts changed after that I hired a I had a strength and conditioning coach, Juan Carlos Santana, and my strength and conditioning coach, not only did we sit down and talk about judo, this guy puts on a gi, signs up for tournaments, and does judo tournaments. Why? Because he wanted to understand what it felt like to have your local muscular endurance taxed in your forearms to the point where you're breathing fine, your legs are fine, but your forearms are gone and your and your hands won't open and close. And if you never felt that before, you it's very difficult for you to be able to train that. And he understood that I was asking him to train me to be one of the best in the world at an activity. And what he did was he bathed himself in it. And that's what he did. So that we all had a great understanding. Pardon the cars, the cars are driving while I'm doing my walk with you, having my coffee. So we all had a great understanding of what was required per the work. And the third thing is, and this is what I learned, because I also looked at the team around Jimmy. And I was in Chicago one day. And I hung out with Mr. Steve Cohen, who's a Olympic coach and a two-time Olympian. And he gave me a tour of his office in Chicago. And while giving me a tour of his office, he sat down and opened up a book of scouting reports. Well, he has scouted everybody in the world it was like three three ring binders where he scouted everybody in the world in Jimmy Pedro's weight class for years for years which is foundationally the the idea behind the the judo scholar reports product that I produced a couple years back and I'm refining it and redoing it right now with a gentleman by the name of Chris Round. Why? Man, because I think it's important to do the work, not only physically, 
but do the work mentally to create the kazushi, to create the off balancing. Because you're not going to be stronger than everybody. But if you know more about that person, even down to what their favorite pizza is, and, and if they're left hand or the right hand, and if what sports do they play, um, do they circle to the left or the right as soon as the match starts? Like, did, can they do the, can they do their favorite and they want move on both sides or, or they just do it on one side like if you know these things they give you an absolute advantage and when Jimmy talked about making sure that they're concerned about you instead of you being concerned about them those were the major three things that I got from it I got Find, finding out, man, who you, who you need to have around you. Finding out the physical work that needs to be done. And then finding out the non-physical work that needs to be done. And then you can sit down and ask yourself the two questions that you gotta ask yourself every time you embark on a new thing. And those two things are, can I and will I? Can I do it? And then will I do it? And after getting all that information, it was overwhelming. I thought, I thought to myself, I said, damn, man, how am I going to do all this? And I'm just by myself. What, what do I have to do? Then I started structuring the team. I started putting the people in place. Virginia Jiu-Jitsu, bam, Lord Irvin. Judo, Eddie Liddy, because he has resources, bed, three hots in the cot. Throwing coach, Angelo Reese, three-time Olympian from, from Puerto Rico. All right. Strength and conditioning coach, Juan Carlos Santana. Grip fighting person, Eddie Liddy. Mentor, person I can lean on. Jimmy Pedro. And you start putting it together. You start putting it together. People I need to hang around, man, I make sure I hang around, hung around Kevin Jackson. Kevin Jackson was the head wrestling coach at LTC. He used to have parties at his house, um, parties when, when they were boxing, when they were boxing fights, big boxing fights, when De La Hoya was, was fighting and Trinidad was fighting and there was big boxing matches. Kevin would have, have some, um, some parties at his house for the for the athletes. And I used to go watch wrestling practice. Why? Because, man, I need to see what's going on. I need to hang around. But Kevin's the Olympic gold medalist. I need to hang around Kevin Jackson. So I started hanging around Kevin Jackson. I started hanging around. I started hanging around Mike Van Arsdale, World Cup champ. I started hanging around. When I saw, I saw, I listen, I started hanging around Apollo. I started, anytime Apollo was in the cafeteria, I went and found my way to sit down next to Apollo and sit down and Track of a conversation. Why? Because I need to be around the exemplars. I need to see what's going on. I need to put myself around the right people. There's no sense to hang around the people who are not winning. I need to hang around the people who are winning. I need to hang around the people who are winning. And I remember being in the weight room one day, at not in the weight room, the trainer room, and I was hanging out with this wrestler, all right? Absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't remember his last name right now while I'm walking. But I got his last name. I remember, I remember, I remember. Because, you know, I call him Melvin. But Melvin Douglas. Melvin Douglas was in the training room with me. We were in there together. And I was watching some film of myself. And I said, uh, Melvin. Because Melvin's a world champ in wrestling. A couple times NCAA champ. I wanted him to watch my film and give me a different perspective. I said, Melvin, what do you see here, man? He watched the film. He said, I got something for you. Jumps off the table. This is Melvin Douglas now. Jumps off the table and shows me how I can use the far side knee tap 
from wrestling in judo by pulling the lapel, cheating over, cutting the angle, punching underneath the chin, covering my hand on the outside of the knee, and then running the person over. I, we're in the training room, okay, going over the far side knee tap, and then he was like, when he steps back, come through, come through the leg. Which is a, that part, that, that, that move was more of a common move in judo. Um, sometimes they call it the five on two. Uh, sometimes it has a different name. I don't know if it's Kuchiki Daioshi or Kuchiki Daioshi. I forget what the name of it is. But the far side knee tap, smooth. So I started working this far side knee tap, inside knee tap with this Yipon Selnai. And all these things happen because I have the right people around me and I never look at anybody <clears throat> as them not having any value or saying that people don't know anything. I never say, oh man, they don't know nothing. I, I, don't, I don't say that. I look, at, I look at the person, I say, what value does this person have and what can I glean from my experiences with this person? And then I go get what I can get and then I give what I can give, then I move on. And that's it. And for me, man, judo is life. That's what it is. As you grow, you also try, as you go, you try to make a, a way to grow, you know? That, that's just what it is. I know you guys hear the cars in the background, but that's just how it is this morning. I, um, I'm out doing my walk and doing my walk a little bit later this morning because I didn't have to go to the gym with my kids this morning because it was a day off so I'm able to get out in the morning and do my walk think talk and do my coffee with Radi so I do have my coffee in hand it is cold as I don't know what in Tampa Florida I'm trying to cover up my hands hold my coffee and, and wipe my nose every five six minutes because my nose is running like it's in a track meet. But that's all I have for you today. I want to let you all know, man, that I love you. But God loves you best. And um, please do me a favor, man, and go to www.judoislife.net and pick up the book today. And if you haven't got my book, Coffee with Rod go to www.coffeewithrodd.com. Take care. Hope I wasn't rambling too much. I woke up in the morning, I got some stuff on my mind that I want to share, and I just go ahead and share it.